Was I supposed to dance at that song? <laughs> we just have to do it all over. <laughs> okay. So uh, awesome. So great that uh, that you're all coming uh, to the, to attend this session. First of all, my apologies. My French is very very bad. I had about two or three years of of French lessons uh, back in high school a long time ago. Uh, only thing I remember of the time is uh, the papa fume une baguette or something. <laughs> No idea what it meant. Um, I am, I'm Dutch, I'm from Rotterdam, but I, I actually live in Brussels, in Belgium. But they speak French there, and they're mainly French speaking, so I struggle my way around the city. I picked up some phrases, uh, so I can, I can say the most common things that you need in Brussels, like, uh, uh, Excusez-moi, votre voiture est sur mon pied. <laughs> Things like that. You need it every day. Things like that. So uh, this uh, this session is called "Manage Yourself," and I will tell you in a moment uh, why that uh, why that is the case. I have uh, my topic is management, as you may have uh, may have realized. Management 3.0 is the is the thing that I'm talking about all over the world. I travel a lot. Uh, the other uh, book that I wrote is how to how to change the world. And uh, I get a lot of questions all over the world. A lot of questions about how to uh, uh, how to change things in the organization, how to uh, 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 how to get developers to uh, self-educate them uh, a bit more, how to get managers to trust the team, how to get uh, 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 HR to abolish some policies. It's always about how to how to change them. <laughs> that is the theme of all the questions. How do I change them, Jurgen? And then I thought about that for a while, and I thought, hmm, maybe part of the, of the problem is that everyone is trying to manipulate everyone else. Everyone is trying to change other people. Maybe this is part of the problem. Maybe we should, maybe we should change ourselves a bit more, lead by example. So that is the theme of this, uh, of this, uh, of this talk. But first, first a story. First a story. Um, it's a family story. My apologies for that. Family story. My sister has, uh, has three kids. The eldest is called Sam. And uh, when Sam was six years old, he was, he's 12 now. When he was six years old, he got a bicycle for his birthday. Dutch people, bicycles, you know how it goes. So uh, the bicycle is very big. Bicycle, boy, Sam. But undeterred because of the size of the bicycle, he jumped on the bike and started cycling around us. And my sister and I were looking at him and feeling very proud, it was going all very well, until he came around the corner and he crashed his bicycle into the bushes. Sam and bike completely disappeared. And before we could help him out, he already uh, uh, emerged from the bushes with twigs and leaves sticking out of his hair and big eyes looking at us with a trembling lip, saying basically, what the fuck just happened? And I remember at that moment, I remember thinking, we should not pity him, because we, when we pity him, he will start to cry. And I love children, except when they're crying. <laughs> not very good at that. <laughs> so before my sister could say anything, I thought, I'm going to teach him a lesson, a life lesson. There's nothing wrong with failing. So I said to Sam, that was a spectacular crash. And he looked at me with big eyes of, yeah, are you sure? I said, absolutely. That was the best fall of a bike I have ever seen. My congratulations. Yeah, yeah. So he wiped his eyes. Yeah, that was a spectacular crash. He agreed, and then he jumped back on his bicycle. I was very proud of myself. I taught him a lesson. Lasted for about two minutes until Sam came back and crashed his bike again in the same bushes. Oh, my God. <laughs> That was also a beautiful crash, we heard him say from the bushes. Yeah, sure, Sam. And my sister said, that was a new bicycle. <laughs> and I said, well, buy him an old bicycle then. Ah, family stories, you know how it goes. I think I made a mistake back then. I made a mistake, and I will show you why. This is one of my most popular diagrams. Um, it, is, uh, it is based on the work of Donald Reinerson. He wrote a fantastic uh, book principles of product development flow. This is basically synthesized uh, from, his, uh, from his work. It says uh, that we, we follow good practices because they usually 
succeed. That is why we call them good practices. There are sometimes failures with our good practices because they don't always work in all contexts. There are mistakes uh, that we can make. I call them uh, mistakes. You could, you could also call them bad practices. Uh, but I prefer mistakes because we don't do them intentionally. And uh, they usually lead to failure. That's why they're mistakes. But sometimes the mistakes can be successful as well. In the middle, we find experiments. That's doing something that you've never done before because you don't know whether it will be successful or not. It, is, it can be a success or a failure. There's a 50-50 chance, perhaps, of, of either of those, uh, those happening. And that is, as Donald Reinison says, where learning is optimal. When there's a 50-50 chance, when you have no idea what's going to happen. Learning is optimal in the middle. We don't learn much when we just repeat good practices or repeat the same mistakes. Interestingly enough, ex uh, experiments is what, uh, what, what networks are good at. Networks of people, some people call them complex systems. They are great at exploring opportunities, finding the opportunities in the fitness landscape, as a scientist uh, would say. Um, hierarchies are good at repeating the same practices endlessly, at exploitation instead of exploration, optimizing for, for, for profit. Once we know what works, uh, uh, do it endlessly. Um, and when those hierarchies are big, we call them enterprises. Right? Hierarchies are also quite good at repeating the same mistakes, I think. When those are big, we call them governments. <laughs> and what is usually the case, well, what, what the, my mistake with Sam, basically, is that, I, that I, I complimented him for failing. Yay, you failed. That is so spectacular. That's wrong. You should not do that. Because I, he was experimenting, trying to learn how to ride his bicycle, but then I, I gave him a compliment for arriving here. But then he wanted another compliment. Well, that would be, me a, be a mistake, right? Repeating the same thing. In businesses, it's often the other way around. We compliment people for successes, for outcomes, for always doing, for ch achieving results with bonuses and, 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 and whatnot. That makes sense up to some extent, but then who is going to run the experiments? Who is going to make sure that we try something new? Hey, we might fail, but that's fine because we learn. So sometimes I hear people say, let's celebrate failure, but that doesn't make much sense. We should celebrate failure when we learn something from it. That makes, uh, makes more sense. So the learning is key here. I use this diagram now in, in workshops, and some people use them at the end of retrospectives. So I, I draw that diagram, and sometimes I, I, I draw a funnel at the top. There's a reminder that we have to drop in new experiments. What are the things that we can try in the next workshop, or next week, in the next iteration in our product development? Um, here's an example of a photo that was sent to me by, uh, uh, by a company in, in, in Bulgaria. They use it at the end of a retrospective. Uh, I think they're using Scrum as a, as a product development uh, method. So they use it as ev evaluation tools. What are the experiments? What are the good and best, uh, bad practices? You can see, by the way, that it's actually a Dutch company because they finished this exercise just before 5 o'clock. <laughs> Yay, everyone, go home now. <laughs> That's so typical, very punctual. So um, I, get, I get the question a lot, as I said. How do we change other people? Well, my point is you have to change yourself. It starts with yourself. Try things out. That is basically my message for this, for this talk. And I'm going to show, show you some things of, uh, of stuff that I have tried out, some concrete management and leadership uh, practices. Because to be honest, there are a great number of books in the world about leadership and management. But often they are a bit too abstract, right? Like, be a servant leader. All right, awesome. How do you do that on Tuesday morning? No idea. Be a system thinker. All right, that sounds great. What does that mean in practice on Wednesday afternoon? No idea. So here are some concrete management exercises, experiments that I have run in the past. This is a picture of a photo in Rotterdam, my hometown. It says, Melly Shum hates her job. That's all. Melly Shum hates her job. It's actually a work of art. It's been hanging there for 25 years and uh, made by a photographer, Ken Lum. And I've been standing there a couple of times wondering, why, Melly? What's wrong? Quit your job, for God's sake. 
go somewhere else. But no, she just sits there smiling, hating her job. We all know some people like that, right? Complaining endlessly about their jobs, but they don't quit. No, 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 no. They have a mortgage to pay and families to feed, but my God, their jobs are terrible. So I thought, I want to do something about that. I want to help Melly. I want to help Melly be happier in their job, or I want to help her quit her job and find a better one. Either one is fine, but I want her to see, smile, want to see her smile for real. So I came up with a company called Happy Melly. This is the name of the company. This is the name of the business. Make, happy, make, make Melly smile. That is the purpose of the, of the company. And it turns out that this, that this is really inspiring for, for people, such a, uh, such a purpose. Um, for example, I did a workshop uh, last, uh, 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 last autumn in, in, uh, in, in Sydney, uh, sorry, in, in, uh, in Melbourne, Australia, and uh, one of the attendees came with this photo, with this photo of Melly Shum hates her job that she took 10 years ago when she visited Rotterdam. And she, and she thought, and she said, isn't this your Melly? I found it in the attic. I found it in the box upstairs because I knew your, your company is called Happy Melly. So she came with a photograph. Yeah, yeah, that's our Melly. That's so awesome. <laughs> she remembered that story from a blog post or, or something. So that inspired her and other people as well. You can see the, you can see the guy at the back there thinking, oh, I wish I had that photograph. <laughs> well, pity. <laughs> Can't win all the time. So that's one thing. Identity symbols and, 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 and messages, stories can be very important in order to inspire people. Sometimes I, uh, I ask uh, uh, people in, 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 in companies or workshops, what is it that, that, that is the purpose of your organization? I asked that a year ago at a, just a small German company, what is the purpose of your organization? It was very silent. Nobody knew. And after 10 seconds or something, one person said, um, I think Peter showed us something in a, in a slide share presentation this morning on a, on, a, on a PowerPoint deck. And I think, well, if the goal of the company is somewhere in a PowerPoint slide deck on the file server, then it's not really a mission statement. It's a mystery statement. Because nobody knows what it is. <laughs> so that doesn't work. You need a story that everyone can relate to. Here's another one, personal maps. This is a mind map that I, that I made of myself, uh, of, my, of, of, of my hobbies and my education and where I live and family and friends and stuff. Um, and I came up with this, this uh, idea because sometimes people say that um, um, uh, uh, you, you, should, you should get people together in one room. You should get them to, to collaborate uh, in, in one room. And I think, well, that is useful, but it is not sustainable because actually the, the trends are all the opposite direction. Remote working, distributed teams, flex time, etc., etc. Everyone is not in the same room anymore in the 21st century. So we need other ways of people getting to know each other. So I came up with the idea of drawing a personal map, either of myself or of another person, and then discussing it with the team. It was the very first exercise that I did with my virtual team in January. I hired a couple of team members, about uh, seven. And uh, our first meeting, we all draw, uh, drawn a personal map of ourselves. And then others, the other team members started asking questions. You're not allowed to present your personal map because we all know what the, ex what the extroverts will be doing, right? They go on and on and on and on about how interesting they are. <laughs> That's not allowed. But people can ask questions. So, for example, this was the personal map that my great colleague Lizette came up with. She used pictures, photos. That's so awesome. <laughs> that says something about the, about the person uh, the, making a personal map like that. Another one uh, by, uh, uh, by Hanu. You can see that Hanu is from Finland. Because people from Finland are very reserved with the amount of information that they share. This is like Finnish design applied to a personal map. <laughs> Simplicity. <laughs> My name is Hanu. I am from Finland. <laughs> All right, Hanu, where in Finland? <laughs> and then the questions got going and the conversation got started. Hanu is awesome, by the way. And the next one is by Sergei, who's obviously a software architect. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Sergei is architecting his own brain. <laughs> That's so cool. He's, a, he's one of my friends. 
So we just shared these, these, these personal maps of ourselves, and, and it got, and got ourselves talking about similarities and differences, and it's all very, very important. There was another experiment that I ran. Here's another one. Number three, I have seven there for you. Work profiles and the project credits. I always credit everyone, the people that I work with. I prefer to, to let the world know that those are the people who made something together with me. Like when I make a video, at the end there will be the names of the people involved as credits. When I make a website, then at the bottom of the website you will see a small line, you can't read it, but a small line of people uh, who created the website. I want them to get those credits, to be, to be named for having contributed to those, to, those, to those products. I think that is important. Not just my own name, but other, name, other people's names there as well. I sometimes do this exercise uh, on these photos in, in, in workshops where I ask people to, to mention their job title on a sticky note in the middle, and then up the top, uh, come up with a sticky note that describes uh, your, your, your ideal title, and then at the bottom, something concrete, your role on a project. So for example, as you can see, I have a lot of CEOs in my workshop. They're just self-employed people. It makes no, this is, this is meaningless, it's ridiculous. Like, oh, I'm CEO, wow. <laughs> there's like, there's job title inflation people. Everyone is C, C star something of, of whatever, who cares? I have senior vice president of the sticky notes and things like that. <laughs> well, good for you. <laughs> So at the, at the very top is the stuff that really matters. That's how people want to express themselves. That is a, a, a sense of identity. You might recognize the, 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 the top of the, pyra the, the Maslow's pyramid of needs, hierarchy of needs, where it says self-actualization at the top. Uh, and that is what it is, because this says that some people call themselves agile enthusiast or, or agile coach. Well, this would clear, clear an agile uh, uh, crowd or uh, um, um, what is this here, uh, interviewer, or uh, continuous learner, or chief happiness officer, or things like that. Arse end of the office is something that I found at some point. Whatever, those are great titles that people give themselves. That makes them happy. That's important, people being happy. So my team members, they can call themselves anything they want. It's fine, uh, as allowed. At the bottom is concrete contributions. What is it that you've actually done? As you can see, there's author there at the bottom. That's my role, for example, for my book. Amazon calls me an author. And even if I write 100 books, they are never going to call me senior vice president of authoring. No, it will be author, again, for the 100th time. But hopefully I get more reviews, more sales. That will be nice. So there will be some sense of progress. And that makes people happy as well when they have progress. So when you have the bottom, people being happy because they make progress in roles and being credited, and you have the top, self-identity, you don't need job titles anymore because they try to capture those two in one practice that doesn't work. Think about that. Some other examples, things that I tried. Um, I'll show you, I'll, uh, let me show you some of my favorite email messages that I received. A bit of bragging here, but I hope you don't mind. This is about Carol, Carol Mays. Your art and ability to capture ideas visually is really fantastic. Your scrolling through is a buffet for the brain. I love that. I love that. It's like poetry. <laughs> it's awesome. A buffet for the brain is my book. Next one is one of my favorites by Betsy. Your English is remarkably good. She's obviously a very intelligent person, this Betsy. You have an incredible feel for the rhythm and idiom of English. You do a magnificent job, and the text is a pleasure to read. Oh, thank you so much, Betsy. I have it above my bed, and I look at it every night before I go to sleep. One of my favorite email messages. Notice, by the way, that Betsy is one of the few people in the world who knows how to spell the word idiom, because usually when people send me an email, they spell it incorrectly with the letter T at the end, which is, of course, silly. So, <laughs> that's another message that I like. And the last one, as an example, by Hamed from Iran. My greatest thanks for your book, for your astonishing book. Every page I read makes me wish to become a manager someday. Oh my God, no! <laughs> More managers. 
That is the opposite of what I intended. The tagline of my book is better management with fewer managers. Now I have more. I failed. Sorry. I'm sorry. What can you do? All right. But I appreciate such messages, of course. They are compliments. Who doesn't appreciate a compliment every now and then? And honestly, royalty statements from publishers, those are nice as well. <laughs> but they only tell you how many people bought your book. It doesn't say how many people actually read it and did something with it uh, and that they found useful, that they found valuable. And if I look back at my happiest moments, is when I get a message that someone says, I tried what you did in our organization and it works and people are so happy. That is so wonderful. That is so cool. And it would be nice if they bought the book, if they stole it, okay, fine. <laughs> I prefer that they actually try these things. I call that a work, work exhibition. Here's another example of a, a, a totally different uh, kind of example of a, a restaurant in, the, in, uh, in Silicon Valley. Persian restaurant. They are proud of what they do. They have, they have uh, newspaper articles and awards that they won and a message, handwritten note by a customer. This makes them feel proud. This gives them a sense of purpose. This is what we do here. It's an exhibition of the work, the compliments, basically, that they received. Here's some other photos that were sent to me, a, a games company from Germany, and this one is from France over there. A company in France, I have absolutely no idea what they're doing. What is the robot in the tutu? <laughs> is that a French thing? <laughs> Whatever, they're happy, they're proud of it, which is awesome. <laughs> so they have a purpose, a sense of purpose, and they turn that, they visualize it with artifacts, and that is really important for, for people, apparently. A couple of more experiments, things that I tried. Um, I, I recently came across the idea of OKRs. It stands for Objectives and Key Results. And this is pop, a practice that is popularized by Google. There's a more than one hour video of OKRs on YouTube. You should check it out, it's very interesting. Actually, Google credits um, Intel. They stole the practice from Intel, they said. I was at Intel two months ago at a conference and I asked them, how many of you know about OKRs? Nobody raised their hands. I said, you don't know you've been robbed by Google. That's so silly. But anyways, Google popularized the practice. And it works like this. You give yourself an objective, yourself, like I obviously wanted to sell more books, duh, uh, at the beginning of the year. And then you give yourself a couple of targets. I just pull those targets out of thin air and say, I'm going to sell this amount of Kindle books and these amount of paper books. Then after a couple of months, you're going to do a self-assessment. You give yourself a grade based on, from, from zero to 100%. Like my Kindle, my paper sales were okay, 60%. Kindle sales, I was apparently far too ambitious and optimistic of what I could do just by myself. So my score was just 36% uh, there. And EPUB, oh God, only 3%. Is anyone an EPUB reader here? Anyone in the audience? Anyone? Yeah. Are you all Pirate Bay users for God's sake? <laughs> oh, no. Thanks for reading anyway. So I failed there. And then you take the average. The average is 33%. That's too low, obviously. You know what Google says? The optimum is not 100%. Because if you achieve 100% of all your targets, it was too easy, apparently. Aim higher. The sweet spot is 60 to 70%, says Google. That's where you should end up, with your, the average of your own targets. And, and everything is transparent at Google. They all have OKRs, they share them with each other. And what I like is that usually, that quite often people ask me that, uh, an, another question, popular question. Jürgen, how do we measure their performance? Is what managers ask me. How do we measure the performance of teams? How do we measure the performance of those individuals? And then I ask them, how do you measure yourself? Whoa, <laughs> that's too difficult, Jürgen, measuring myself. Are you kidding? I have a very complex job. <laughs> well, they have complex jobs as well, right? And if you don't know how to measure yourself, then don't even start trying to measure somebody else, right? Fix the problem for yourself first, and that is what OKRs do. You set yourself targets. I love it. We use them on our team. We're trying to adapt them now. 
Two more examples of things that I'm experimenting with. Some of you know perhaps the idea of, uh, of um, uh, value lists. Are there any people who, who, who uh, use Scrum as a software development methodology? Any, any hands? Any? Oh, wow, quite a lot, quite a lot. Well, Scrum has, these, has this value list of five values, right? It's something like um, respect, openness, transparency, religion, fundamentalism, something like that. <laughs> I always forget which ones. I always forget. So sorry. So sorry. It's, it's, uh, I, I cannot even remember a shopping list of three items when I go to the Del Hesa. My God. So let alone five items of Scrum. Who cares? But it's a good exercition, it's a good attempt at communicating values, but it's not enough. What we do with my team, we share stories. We use Slack as a communication channel, and uh, one of the channels is called Value Stories. One, is, uh, one of them is called Value Stories, and there we share stories that, of, of things that we did because of ethical considerations, things that we found important. Um, so, one of the last stories I shared was, for example, um, it was here in Paris, just last month. I was at the uh, Gare du Nord in the neighborhood and I arrived at a fabulous coffee place, which is already a miracle here in Paris, by the way, because there are only Starbucks. I have Starbucks everywhere, my God, but I found it. One fantastic, fantastic coffee place. And they served me a wonderful cafe latte. And then I thought, I want another one, an hour later. So I went there to the counter, and at that moment, the girl who was making coffee was being filmed for marketing reasons or whatever. And she was already making a latte, and it was being filmed, and she did her best. It would look gorgeous, gorgeous latte art. And then we, when she was done, I said, I would like a latte, please. Well, do you, would you like this one? I said, yeah, sure. That's the, like the perfect version you just made. <laughs> And then I had that latte. And then when it was time to go, I wanted to pay for my bill, and she charged one coffee. And I said, no, I had two. She said, yeah, no, no, but the other one was, uh, was for free. I said, but I'm going to pay for it anyway, because it was the best, and you even filmed it. <laughs> so I paid for two. I insisted, because she did her best. Um, I don't care if it's just a few euros, but that, it made her smile, and it made me smile as well. And this is a typical story that I share with my team. It's something that happened, it's sort of work-related, and I thought it was important. It was important for me. I wanted to pay that person who made me a wonderful cup of coffee. We share these stories all the time with, on, the, on the Value Stories channel. People remember stories. I'm sure you will remember this story more easily than when I had shown you five bullet points of values. right? And then later you can think back, hmm, what kind of value was there in that story? Maybe integrity or something? I don't know. I'll leave the discussion to you. Last example. Last experiment. Something that we're, uh, we're doing. There is this... Uh, it says that I have still two minutes, by the way, but it started at 30, so I'm going to cheat because they promised me 40 minutes. <laughs> I know that because this one says... 28, right? And I had 40, so I'm going to tell this very, very slowly. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, there's, uh, there's this practice that, that, that pervades the corporate world, which is called the bonus system. You know it? You've heard of it? Yeah, yeah. It goes like this. One person, usually the boss, this, uh, says, well, uh, we earn good money with each other. Um, I don't want to pocket all of that in my own, in my own uh, back pocket, so I'll give some of that to the employees. That's nice. That's nice. I, I, I appreciate that as an employee. But then what the person does is then he or she decides who gets how much. There's one thing that you know for sure. Everyone is going to hate that manager for not doing a good job at deciding who gets how much, except for the one who got most. Of course. You think, oh, he did a great job. <laughs> Everyone else will hate the manager. Um, I don't really like that particular approach. I like the alternative. Uh, the alternative uh, that I call merit money, but it has a lot of different names. They use it at Shopify, at Valve, at medium.com, at IGN, lots of interesting companies out there. Basically, 
top management decides the size of the budget, but they don't do the distribution. They leave that to the crowd. So everyone gets their own portion of the bonus money on one condition. You cannot keep it for yourself. You have to give it to others around you. Then let the games begin. Ooh, <laughs> interesting, interesting. So for example, um, I could give uh, half of my bonus money to you because you helped me out when I was feeling depressed last month. I was very, very sad because you sat on my bonsai tree. I hate you for that. It was completely flat. So depressed. I was about to call in sick for the next six months, but you helped me through. You said, you're gonna come on, you can do it. You, and I really appreciate that. So I give you 50% of my bonus money. And half of the rest I split among all the other team members. Except you, of course, you get nothing. <laughs> I can do that. It's my little portion of the bonus money. But then everyone else has their own reasoning, right? Their own way of distributing. Now this is a silly example, obviously. But we actually do this. <clears throat> this is what we do with my team. Uh, we use a tool called Bonusly. There are, I've counted five or six tools already in the last year that emerge for peer crediting in an organization. These are the points that I received, 25 points from Sergey for my inspiring ideas. Yeah, thanks, Sergey. Wow. Um, 15 from Jennifer. Candid and open, of course, I'm Dutch. Um, and dedicated even when sick. Uh-huh, uh-huh, she noticed that, that I was working even if I, when I had the flu, and she gave me some credits for that. At the bottom, 10 points from Lizette for wearing the same shirt. What the f Well, whatever. Thanks, Lizette. Awesome. And I gave some credits to my team members as well. And then over time, you accumulate credits, and every now and then the CEO says, all right, there's money. Let's convert the credits to real money. Ta-da. Problem solved. You earn money through merits, through credits in the system. And everyone around you decides what your performance is, how much you have contributed to the, to the whole. Obviously, there's always questions. The one question that always comes up, always, is doesn't this become a popularity contest? Does this become a popularity contest? And I say, well, maybe, maybe not. We haven't noticed it in my team, but maybe it happens in your organization. But you already have a popularity contest with the old traditional system. It is called kissing the boss's ass. <laughs> That's the popularity contest you already have. The difference is, this is democratized ass kissing. <laughs> you have to kiss a lot of asses, I can tell you from experience, my God, oh, your lips will turn blue, kissing all the time. It's this, today is Chege, tomorrow Lizette, and then Hanu, oh my God. Yes, this is what it means to take care of team members around you and be valuable to all of them. So. Time's up. I knew that. I knew that. I knew that. So, um, what can we learn from this? People ask me all the questions, uh, questions all the time. How do we change them and how do we change them? And my point is, you change yourself. Right? You start yourself by doing good stuff, by running experiments, because that's when you learn. I had a fantastic compliment recently from one of my team members, Jennifer. I think it was a compliment, actually. Because she said, Jürgen, you're my first manager who doesn't suck. <laughs> wow. Um, thanks, Jennifer, I guess. I'll consider it a compliment. I'll consider it a compliment. It means also that there's a lot of room for improvement, which is good. <laughs> I'm still not great. <laughs> I don't suck after 25 years. <laughs> that's, as, that's as far as I got. And I think the reason that I don't suck is because I try things with my team and I never try to change them. I says, look, I have an idea. Shall we try it? And they say, yeah, sounds like fun. Just like children. Let's play with this. And then we figure out, does it work or does it not work? It doesn't work. All right, let's throw it away. We'll try something else. And they find that cool. And that's how you become a great manager, by trying these things. So, 
Back to this diagram, do stuff in the middle, run experiments. By all means, compliment people for successes. We credit each other for achievements, obviously, but we also credit each other for good behaviors, even when we failed. But at least we learn something from that. You can read all of this in this wonderfully colorful book called Workout. I see some people, wow, there's an awesome person over there. Hold it up, hold it up. Yeah, 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 that's cool, it's cool. Uh, there's a paper copies. There's also free version. You don't have to buy it as long as you do something, as long as you run experiments and try something with your team. If you steal, steal hers for all I care. <laughs> so do something. You can download the free book and this presentation later tonight. I was unable to upload it this afternoon, so I'll do it later tonight. If you go to this URL, m30.me slash Jurgen Appel, you'll be able to download the book and the presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Wonderful. Applause